<laughs> Thank you. No, that's okay. Now, on Resurrection Prologue of the Judeo, yeah, it's a prologue of the Judeo Spanish edition, page uh, 32 and 33. You can all find this in Spanish. Um, and uh, do, do you want me to read it again, or it's okay? Yes. All right. Yes, read again. It has been my will to give this book in vulgar Romance language because I write for the benefit of my country and all those who wish to investigate the truth. And I do not think that I deserve reproach for having written like this, since Jeremiah's disciples communicated or things, the mystery of reincarnation and others, uh, various secrets with Plato. S uh, Simeon the Just, uh, uh, Shimon has Sadiq, did the same with Aristotle. Also finding that the most distinguished Hebrews wrote very learned books in the vulgar language, such as Rabbi Moshe of the, uh, Maimonides. This is uh, how he mentions uh, Maimonides, uh, Rabbi Moshe of uh, the Egypto. In his guide for the perplexed, he wrote that in the Arabic language, Philo, a learned Hebrew in the Greek language, Lord Yehuda Arbarvanel in Italian, and so many others, each one in his vernacular, Josephus, that great historian, says these words in the preface to his book of antiquities that he composed in Greek. Along with this, he had seriously reflected that our greatest Hebrews in past times freely communicated the things with strangers, and that some of the Greeks took great desire to know things, because it is written that King Ptolemy, second of this name, a man entirely dedicated to letters, and to collecting books, tried with great diligence to translate into Greek or law and its institutions and the due way that it comes us. It's interesting when we mention institutions, it's interesting that Rabbi Al Mosnino says that the, the structure of the, um, uh, of the Sanhedrin uh, was a uh, republic because it was the, the ruling of the, of, the, of the wise and of the sages. But Elisha, whom known of her high priest equal, did not want to take away this benefit from the king and undoubtedly would have rejected it if it had not been the custom of our elders not to leave out of the reach of anyone what is good and honest. Now I leave the floor to Esther Akunis uh, for uh, a Sephardic song. Uh... Right. Great, thank you. Escalerica de oro, de oro y de marfil, para que suba la novia a dar Now, uh, now I'm going to read the second excerpt. Um, I'm going to go and share the screen again. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's on in the book on resurrection, point six, point three, page ninety-six. 
According to Rabbi Moshe of Egypt and Rabbi Joseph Aldo, the Sefer Haikarim, uh, Ma'amar uh, or Book 4, Chapter 29, the precepts should be observed for themselves, in themselves, and done with virtue for their own sake, without serving God with the hope of remuneration, and should be observed almost as if it was a commodity to barter something priceless. But out of love, serving only to do God's will. Or as Isaac uh, Bravanel says, peras, price, which is understood as the corporal reward. And thus it meant it should not be to serve God with the intention of receiving such a price. Because mm. the true precept is in the spiritual life. Since what happens here with the bodies is nothing more, as they say, than the interests of the principal that is saved for the world of souls. So we are getting here only the interest of the principle that we'll get in Dolan Chaba. <laughs> Finally, the intention of the ancients was righteous, but Sadok and Baitos, his disciples, wicked men and friends of the novelties, friends of the new, today every, almost everyone in the world is a friend of what's new, who wished to be the head of some sect, the Sadducees, spoke with each other after they heard such a thing and said, true, our teacher does not feel that there is another life. And that is why he says that God should not be served with such an intention, for it would certainly be in vain, because after death there is no immortal thing. And to cover up that Vidyanus evil, at first they declared that they denied the tradition and interpretation that the wise men gave to the divine scriptures. Because uh, I discussed uh, how uh, Greeks had uh, a politics and were wise and had a politics of religious tolerance. When we when we read the Hassad and, and the commentaries uh, uh, about uh, Alexander the Great, we see uh, uh, how he communicated, and there are stories about his communication with uh, Shimon uh, Hatzadik. And uh, we should not forget that um, for Shimon. Shimon Hatzadik communicated with Aristotle, and Aristotle was a teacher of uh, Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great, Alexandria of Macedonia, had Aristotle in his mind, has the metaphysics in his mind, had this education when he conquered all the countries that he conquered. So one of the greatest empires in the history of the world, and, of the world and he had uh, Aristotle in his mind. And he had in his mind this uh, politics and this admiration for Jews and this politics of uh, tol religious tolerance, which mm -hmm. can be compared to, 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 the, to the old form of laicism, which was respect for, the, for every religion uh, in private in, 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 the, in the Renaissance. And uh, when Sadok and Baitus uh, came, uh, that was after the death of Alexander, after the, this uh, reign of, uh, of uh, tolerance and this reign of reason. And, um, and then came a, a period of secularism uh, where the Jews were oppressed. And we, we all know the story of Hanukkah. It's important to think uh, w uh, next Hanukkah that when we uh, mention uh, the Greeks, uh, it's important to mention that uh, there were good relationships with the Gre Greeks at the time of Alexander. So, and th there was this uh, this uh, transfer of information, and uh, somehow the Hebrews. I think I think it's what Menasseh and Israel thinks that the Hebrews brought the concept of spirituality to the Greeks. And in this concept of spirituality that we find also in metaphysics, we find the concept of uh, the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead, which is less evident, but uh, uh, definitely we find in, in, in Aristotle, the, in metaphysics, the concept of uh, the immortality of the souls that I think and probably Menasseh Ben Israel thought that came from the Hebrews. So I'm going to leave you with the next song of uh, uh, Esther Akunis. Hello, the next song is Abraham Avino. Mm -hmm.
Continue with the third excerpt. Uh, I was mentioning Sadok, uh, who was the head of this sect, uh, the Sadoki, the Sadducees, Sadokites and the Sadducees, and uh, they um, they uh, diverged. They they went into a different direction, and uh, the Sadducees and the Karaites they denied this concept of the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the death. And when we deny the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead, when we think that there is, or when someone thinks that there is only this life, obviously that's a start of uh, wickedness because there is there is only one life. There is no consequence. People think, wicked men think that they can get away from things because everything happens in this world. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, started back then with uh, with the uh, with the philosophy of uh, epicurus and this is an important distinction um to to understand the concept of epicurus and when we approach greeks especially in exanoga and we say oh the greeks culture the the greeks this is meant of a particular period of the wicked part of greeks but we cannot say that all greeks were epicureans that's uh, that was that is not true only a, sm a small uh, school of philosophy of Greeks were Epicureans, and they infected uh, Hebrews with uh, Epicureanism. And uh, what we understand as Epicureans is what is known today in, in, in Judaism as Apicorsim and Apicores. The Epicureus was uh, Apicores. So uh, I'm going to read another excerpt about this uh, point. This is my footnote on point 6.1, uh, page 101. I quoted in this footnote Rabbi Saul Levi Morteira, who was a contemporary of Rabbi Menasseh ben Israel. In his historiography, Eternity of the Law of Moses and the Providence of God narrates that when the people of Israel ruled themselves, the sect of the Sadducees appeared among other sects. They could oppress them with force without anyone being able to stop their growth and enrichment until the loss of government. It's in chapter 16, uh, page 80 of uh, Providence of God or the Book Eternity of the Law uh, by Rabbi Saul Levi Mortera. The Sadducees contradicted some traditions but the blessed God did not exterminate them with his particular providence, nor with wars, nor with inquisition, but with his spirit. So despite this, the Christian gospels that came out afterwards brought wars and discord with each other and never finished until this day. This is in chapter 32, page 235. And I comment, the, the dissension that the Gospels caused against the Sadducees is illustrated in the book of Acts. And it's interesting, my, my, Maimonides says, uh, you, you take the truth from wherever it comes. And here we find, we find a source from uh, another uh, uh, tradition. And there, in their tradition, in the book of Acts, uh, uh, this uh, personage Paul realized that one part of the Sanhedrin at that time 
the National Jewish Court were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees. So he attests that uh, they were already divided and the Sadducees were already in the Jewish court and they were already in the highest position of the judges. He says, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. I'm judged because of my faith in the resurrection of the dead. When he said that there was a dispute between the Sadducees and Pharisees and the assembly was divided. This is in, in their book, Acts 23, uh, point six uh, and seven. The high priest at this time was Ananias of the new Babylonian lineage of Sadducees, which literally means the descendants of Sadoc, whose influence grew with the wealthy returnees from Babylonia who rebuilt the temple. Now, um, I read between the lines, I think it's a secret and it's a very important point. Um, Menashe and Israel suffered a lot of prejudice and uh, a lot of uh, misunderstanding because he had very well connection with the Christian monarchs and with the people from the Christian monarchy and Christian aristocrats. And Jews today might think, even in Jews in London, when he was not so welcomed in London, think how this man can have such good relationships with the Christian aristocracy when we have been and at the uh, war and discord and they persecuted us etc etc there was inquisition going on and they said how is it possible this man he must be an heretic and and the secret I want to share with you is something that I understood reading between the lines of uh, Manasseh ben Israel is that he he's very firm and he states very firmly this distinction between the the Hebrews, the Pharisee and Hebrews, and the Sadducee and Hebrews. And that's a very important distinction because we have here two two different uh, uh, ways of uh, Judaism, ways of life, and the Sadducees denied. The, the immortality of the soul and the, the resurrection of the dead. And then in the source that I showed earlier, from this, another tradition, from the tradition of the, of the Christian monarchies, they blame, they blame the Sadducees for the uh, condemnation of uh, their personage, of the picture of their Messiah. And this is very important because when Jews faced anti-Semitism in general is because Jews were generalized and uh, and because of the generalization and the and the confusion of uh, Hebrews of Pharisean tradition and Hebrews of Sadducean tradition so it's very important when a Jew faces anti-Semitism today especially from a Christian especially from hardcore Christians it's very important to to mention that uh, Jews didn't kill their personage of the picture of their Messiah, but that was a problem with the Sadducees. That's what not a problem with us. We had nothing to do with it. We had already a political problem and an ideological problem with the Sadducees at that time. And you can go to that source in their book and they will know that uh, there is a distinction between the Pharisean tradition and the Sadducean tradition. We said to the to the to the to the Christians and to the people descended from the from the Greek culture and from the the, the Greeks uh, to Greek Roman European tradition. Oh, you are a, you are a you are a Picorsim. you are Epicureans. We put them all together into one pack of Epicureanism when we are not distinguishing them from the other Greco-Roman European tradition of, uh, of classical uh, literature and classical thought. And in the same way that we discriminated against them as Epicureans, they, in return, they, they said, uh, oh, you were like the Sadducees, you were Epico Epicureans like the Sadducees because the Sadducees were Epicureans. So I don't know if you get the idea what uh, the, the same, um, the same, um, um, reticence that we observed against uh, against them 
is what we got as a reciprocal effect uh, towards us. So it's very important. I think that's a very important point that uh, Menace Ben Israel uh, said and did in distinguishing the Sadducean, tra the Sadducees tradition from the Pharisean tradition. And today, the Jewish tradition today, the rabbinic tradition today is the heritage of the Pharisean tradition and of the Pharisees. So we have to, we have to make this point very clear, have this point very clear in our mind and, and study this from the text of uh, Menasseh bin Israel and other texts and uh, really, as the rabbi said, uh, bring our past into our times and into the future. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to leave you with the last song of Esther. Uh... <laughs> Thank you.